Uh, good evening, Tina Koto. Welcome to our second webinar of 2023. My name is Lucinda Thatcher, and tonight we have Elaine Nottenbelt, a haematologist from Palmerston North Hospital in MedLab Central, who is kind enough to do round two, um, along with Mark Lang and Hannah Lorne, uh, rural hospital medicine specialists from Hawara. Um, we are going to discuss elevated haematology cell lines. You'll be able to tell me if that's not quite right, Elaine. Um, we are very grateful uh, for all of your time and expertise this evening, uh, team. And our session this evening is run by the section of Rural Health General Practice Department, University of Otago, and supported by the Rural Hospital Medicine Division of the Rural New Zealand College of General Practitioners, and is endorsed for one hour of CME. I can claim this for you if you lodge your uh, medical council number when you fill out the feedback form at the end. I have actually been having a few issues uh, with some of the numbers given to me. So I will often, whenever I lodge it on the um, college website, there will be one, two, five that will come back. And one of the reasons that's been given is that you're not registered with the college. So just bear that in mind if you're not and I can't lodge it for you. Um, and then you'll just have to do it manually yourself. Uh, as usual, we are very keen for this to be an interactive session. So please lodge any questions within your chat um within the chat and we will be going through them as we go through uh after each sort of topic i will now hand over to elaine uh, to start our evening welcome thank you elaine thank you for inviting me back um i have to say hematology is my absolute passion um and i love just the the simplicity and the sort of logic and the almost the mathematics of hematology because it can be quite number based, but I guess it's like any sequence of numbers and things. You just think, well, what, what can I make of this pattern? So it, when you think about hematology, you often just think about the lows. There's the anemia, the neutropenia, the thrombocytopenia, and all the malignancies and the iron deficiency anemia. Um, but we get a lot of referrals and a good chunk of hematology relates to high counts. And you think, well, more is better. Uh, sometimes it's, it's better to have more, but sometimes it's better to have less. So I thought it would be quite good just to give you um, just like a sort of a tasting plate of what I've called the highs of hematology in the hope that that's sort of tempting, tempting you to go to the dessert table and see what we've got. So these are the highs that we're going to go through. Um, and, you know, I, we look at about 25 referrals a day. Um, and there's always in there um, these issues. And I guess my uh, it's a bit of an investment being able to talk to you um, to get you um, getting a little bit more comfortable with the highs and knowing what you can keep looking after uh, and managing it yourself. And if you do refer patients to us, we, we love, we love to, to help you with it. But maybe just a few more a couple more extra sentences of thought processes, which I think will help you build up your confidence and your and the, and the next step in dealing with the highs. I think um, I talk at uh, Hara over my lunch break when I'm there doing a clinic, and I'm just very aware from the, um, particularly the junior doctors, that their hematology training at medical school is quite sparse. Um, and so going back to just a few basic things, I think can, can uh, make things quite exciting and, and hopefully just empowering. Uh, and I think overall that's more efficient because if you can deal it with yourself, you're not writing a referral letter, you don't have to deal with the referral coming back. And it's sort of kind of more satisfying. And also the patient will love you for it as well, because living rurally, your patients have to travel quite a long way um, to get an opinion with us. We're doing a lot of phone consults, um, and that has its pluses and minuses. But at the end of the day, you're the one with the patient in front of you that you can see. And when we read your referral, we can't. So we're going to, first of all, um, deal with high hemoglobins. Now, technically, in hematology, we call that erythrocytosis. Easy, just too many red cells. Uh, and just to get it out of the way, I uh, suppose you're sending them to us because you think they may have polycythemia vera. That often presents really very typically. And sort of like a few key questions or things to notice is, have they already had a clot? Have they had gout? 
and mostly do they itch after showering and it can be quite subtle you actually have to ask them because they might not know you know and they just say oh yeah you know I can't have a hot shower and I, and I rub my you know rub myself uh, and they might not actually even notice that so th those are a couple of things then um, with when you're looking at the blood count it's often not just a high hemoglobin you'll have a high neutral count and a high platelet so you can see polycythemia is like all the cells tend to be raised, not just the hemoglobin. So that's a, that's a good little trick there. And then if you go down and you read the hematology scientists or the hematologist comment, platelet morphology is also quite fun. So if you've got large and giant platelets, basically it's a myeloproliferative disorder and you, you're there without, you can shortcut the thinking process if there are all those things there. And then obviously you're going to go, boom, you're going to do a jack 2 mutation and send them to hematology. The other, the other little trick that it's happened less recently, but just think about if you've got a high hemoglobin and an MCB of 60, we have had cases where iron's been given because the ferritin is low and they appear iron deficient. That actually is really, really dangerous. So just a little caution there, please don't give iron to somebody with a high hemoglobin, even if they're iron deficient. That's um, that we've had people with natural, naturally induced iron deficiency bump their hemoglobins up to 223 and come in with a PE or a stroke or something like that. So just that's just something to bear in mind. So the JAK2 mutation is our shortcut. We used to do bone marrows on all these poor people. Uh, now you get a positive JAK2 mutation and, you, uh, and you're done. So if they're not that obvious, I've got this little algorithm here and all these highs that I've got for you, I've got little algorithms. I'm not going to go through the algorithms, but you can screenshot them. Uh, this PowerPoint can be circulated and you can, you can steal them. These aren't in a textbook because I've done them to sort of suit myself, really, and a little bit lab-based. But maybe, maybe as you um, sort of get more excited about high hemoglobins, hopefully, um, you know, you can just have a, have a play. Um, the two reflex tests are JAK2 mutations and erythropoietin levels. But really, um, at the top is like, what is the patient seeing you for and how are they looking? And this is a classic one. Um, his surname's not there, so we can call him Donald, I think. Um, and he's on a long-term testosterone therapy, and he's developed polycythemia. Well, that's actually the end of the story. You don't actually need to do anything else. Um, his hemoglobin is 191 with a high PCB. He'll have a normal white count and a normal platelet count. Um, he, uh, my colleague was consulted. And just because we always worried about covering ourselves and making sure we do everything, I don't know what the conversation actually was, but a JAK2 mutation and an erythropoietin level was done. Now, surprise, surprise, the erythropoietin level is right up there. Um, that's a, a, a high erythropoietin level. So that is likely to be testosterone driven. But the a tricky thing here is the JAK2 mutation was also done. And I think you can just end it up in a bit of soup because there it's got a tiny little JAK2 mutation. And then what are you going to do with this information? That's a very low level. If you've got polycythemia vera, the JAK2 mutation is usually quite chunky. You know, it can be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent, not 0.2. Now you've got that. Now you've got, you've got to deal with that. So the, the patient's been perfectly managed. The testosterone therapy is on hold, and then it, um, it'll be reintroduced. Um, whether he, the JAK2 has made him respond a little bit more to the testosterone therapy, I, d I personally don't care. I just think you've got to get rid of the secondary factors first and foremost. It's a bit like alcohol in your ferritin levels. <laughs> um, if you're drinking 12 cans of beer a night and your ferritin's high, then a section to remove the iron isn't, isn't serving the patient. I hope that makes sense. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. So basically, 
If you do an EPO level, polycythemia vera is highly unlikely. Um, so if you are triaging a patient that doesn't look like they've got polycythemia vera, an erythropoietin level is probably a good thing to do. I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to work out why, why that is. And then I'll tell you why. <laughs> because it's something that people find, can't get their head around. So basically, your hemoglobin production is driven by erythropoietin produced by the kidneys in response to oxygenation. If your bone marrow is autonomously making red cells, independent of erythropoietin, there's going to be this negative feedback from the kidney saying, enough, enough, enough. And it's going to turn the erythropoietin left off, but it's going to make no difference. If the bone marrow is responding normally to erythropoietin, a high erythropoietin level is a message from the kidneys saying, make, make more hemoglobin, even if it's not appropriate. So that's just, um, just to think about the erythropoietin needle. They used to be quite inaccurate um, and we never used to trust them, but I must say I'm probably using them more now that the assay's got a lot more reliable. So here's another case. <laughs> so this is likely secondary to chronic hypoxia, COPD, hypoxic on oxygen sets, obstructive sleep apnea on CPAP and a smoker. Much more can you want? <laughs> you can't want much more, really. Um, notice that the platelet count is normal. The white count and um, neutrals are just very slightly up, probably because of smoking. This patient really doesn't need anything, except to say that maybe a hemoglobin of 202 is quite high, even for hypoxia, but not that high for three major things that are doing are. Um, are driving that. But of course, we do eject, we do an erythropoietin level, it's normal, not polycythemia vera, but the reflex is to do a JAK2 mutation. And now we have another piddling little JAK2 positive mutation that you now have to say, and what do I do with this result? And is it even important? So do we do venesection here? We'll just give you a little chance to think about whether you would want to venesect this patient. I don't want to benefit this patient. It's the same thing as the ferritin argument. You've got to address the underlying cause. You've got to stop them smoking. They've got to use their CPAP machine and you've got to try and get their oxygen as best as you can. Sometimes even if it's home oxygen. Um, um, but uh, benefiting them is not the issue. Elaine, could you just clarify the normal ranges for erythropoietin? It'll just help some other... People to like know uh, I think, I think the it's it's a, it's like five to fifteen, something like that. Yeah, I might be wrong by a few points. <laughs> I'm not having it in front of me. Yeah. So basically, when you get a, a low EPO level in um, Pivera, you're looking at a level of one or two. If you've got an erythropoietin secreting tumor, you're looking at 12 to 20 to 25. No man's land with a normal erythropoietin level is always slightly more tricky, particularly if the level's three or four. But honestly, the, the more you swing towards the high, this is, this is not the issue. So you see, I don't think we needed to see that person, but I guess the referral is concerns about venesection. Um, but we don't, we don't, we don't venesect our high hematocrit with that with that situation. So here's another one: obstructive sleep apnea and asthma, much less extreme, and basically fluctuating in and out of normal with a normal white count, normal neutrals, normal platelets. But they get a JAK2 mutation. And now this is 6%. And the erythropoietin level is normal. So this isn't a polycythemia vera. If the patient was clotting, uh, had P unexplained PEs, had gout, 
had paratus, uh, had a spleen, if your clinical suspicion was high, you could say, bingo, I got a positive Jack G mutation. But I'm not sure that we needed to have done the Jack 2 mutation or even the erythropoietin level in this situation. And really what we're doing is spending a lot of money and just creating a lot of anxiety. Would you put this patient on aspirin? I wouldn't. I wouldn't do anything. I would just try and correct the obstructive sleep apnea and asthma. Uh, if it was very, very mild asthma, but what's not given here, the oxygen levels and the BMI of the patient and so on. So, yeah, so that's tricky, isn't it? So we're going to have questions at the, uh, at the end of this erythrocytosis. So if you want to put, put them in the, however you do your questions, that would be great. So basically, low-level JAK2 mutations are useful if you're trying to confirm a diagnosis that's already there. Um, but I suspect we're all swarming around in the community with the low-level check mutations. Um, and really, once you've got them there, you have to document them and maybe just be more vigilant about the blood count. And maybe in a young person, you might want to repeat the JAK2 mutation. Uh, and maybe if they did present with the clot, remember that they were positive, but really tricky. Um, if you've got a high hemoglobin and a high erythropoietin level that you can't find a cause for, I think there's a really good case for doing an abdominal ultrasound looking for renal secreting tumors. In fact, I remember seeing a patient in hematology who came with splenomegaly. Um, and I thought, oh, this doesn't move with respiration. And I thought, oh, and it was actually an enormous kidney tumor. And they had, they had a high hemoglobin. So, you know, palpating the abdomen is really good, um, but an abdominal ultrasound since renal lesions can be quite subtle and late to diagnose. So that's just um, something there. Uh, often in a young person, sort of completely out of the blue, I think I've had seen this in the sort of 16, 18 year old, um, where it really is otherwise unexplained. Uh, and generally we don't finish secondary erythrocytosis. Um, some try say that there's a case for venesecting under a hematocrit of 0.55. I don't particularly subscribe to that. So that's, that's just a, a little bit of a, a tasting plate of erythrocytosis. So it's a good time just to pause and just um, see if there's any questions that arise out of that. I've got a couple of lanes just quickly. Yeah. Um, so can you just clarify, you know, with the JAK2, what would be considered a significant level in a haematologist's eyes? Less than two. Less or than two. Piviera. Right. And then above the normal range. Okay. Or, yeah. But, but the no man's land, you still have to find an explanation for your erythrocytosis. And it's likely to be secondary. But if it's like, if you've got an erythropoietin level of three or four, and you strongly, subject, you strongly suspect polycythemia vera, and the JAK2 is negative, you can go on and do some of the other tests, molecular tests for polycythemia vera, which is um, the exon 12 JAK2 mutation. But Canterbury Health won't do that without a low erythropoietin level. So they're pretty convinced that polycythemia vera doesn't happen with a normal level. My colleagues would all come up with cases where they've diagnosed it with a normal level, but it's a low normal level. So it's a bit like in town, you go, you get, go through that bit of a gray zone. And just to clarify, when you say a low normal level, you mean of EPO? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're talking about JAK2 level. No, 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 just in that second bit, yeah, just yeah. clarify. Yeah. yeah. The, the, um, the, the JAK2 mutation is detectable at 
I'm trying to remember whether it's 0 0.08 or 0.8, but basically they're, they're usually chunky. You know, they're usually in whole single figures anyway. <laughs> um, and the more the more obvious the myeloproliferative disorder, the higher the, the JAK2 mutation. And it does evolve over time. So polycythemia vera evolving into myelofibrosis often has an increased JAK2 mutation burden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then in terms of, you know, so say like your uh, secondary polycythemias, in terms of a significant, because obviously we're not going to venusect them. So some of us might get a little bit worried about a hemoglobin of 200 secondary to your hypoxia or your smoking yeah. or, you know, um, in terms of the risk of thrombosis and managing them. Um, are you quite happy with it, that? Like it, what it, I suppose it, my question it, it, is. It's, it's, min it's minimal compared with if it's driven by a myeloproliferative disorder. Right. Okay. If they, if they are presenting with thrombosis and they've got a high hematocrit, we could benefit them to like 0.55. But remember, it's hypoxia driven. Mm. Um, so really, it, the message is correct the hypoxia. Yes, okay. Just with what it, whatever means. And it works, it, it, it does work. I won't say never say never, because again, hematologists will vary um, with their, you know, with their, their criteria. So some people would say, oh, at 0.6, let's get it down to 0.55. But I'm not sure of the evidence for that. And whenever I try and look it up, I can't really find the evidence. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Any All others, right. Mark? No, um, we had a question from Mohan, but I think you pretty much answered it about um, people who have been told to venesect secondary um, polycythemia. Do some patients walk out of um, venesection feeling much better? Is there a bit of a, um, I don't know. Well, with secondary polycythemia? Or, or any, uh, yeah. Yeah, was it, we, we used to venesect cyanotic congenital heart disease, but um, the cardiologists are adamant that that is very, very dangerous to do that. Uh, and inducing iron deficiency actually makes the, the red cell not deformable and actually increases the risk of thrombosis. Um, but we will like um, venesect them if they're suffering headaches and... In, in the congenital heart disease, but honestly, we ha I ha we haven't done that like for 20 years. So I don't know where they've all gone. So I think that implies that there's no evidence of benefit in that group anyway. Yeah. Good. Yep. Great. Thank you, Elaine. So now lymphocytosis. I haven't gone into this hugely, and I've just got a couple of cases here. Um, lymphocytosis is really, really common, as you know. Um, and I think the main thing to remember is why are you seeing the patient and why have you done a blood count? Um, there's a lot of reactive causes for lymphocytosis, but fair to say they're not very high. So we'll just get out of the way that the 18-year-olds with EBV, the babies with pertussis, the, um, you know, the, the acute ones are all not really an issue. The chronic ones, um, there's a, a smoking lymphocytosis. So if it's sitting like between four and five um, and they're heavy smokers, you don't really need to do anything about that. Just leave them alone. If they've had a spleen out, you get high monocytes, lymphocytes, neutrophils, platelets. Anything goes once you've had your spleen out. Um, and then the other thing that makes you think it's reactive and the the you know, Tology comment should help you there. Um, if they're wildly atypical, where infectious mononucleus nucleosis comes from, the lymphocytes start to look like monocytes and look very pleomorphic and wild. Uh, and again, it depends on what your situation is. If somebody's got like an eight centimeter cervical lymph node and they have abnormal lymphocytes in their peripheral blood, that's, that's very different from sort of generalized small painful tender lymphadenopathy in, a, in an 18-year-old. So 
um, occasionally we have to just sort of say, oh, let's do some viral studies. And if it doesn't go away, have a low threshold. Um, but if, if you've got a huge big lymph node and the, and the uh, lymphocytosis is wild, you want to crack it on with surface markers. So I've just listed some of the lymphoproliferative disorders that can present with the lymphocytosis. Um, and basically, the, the bread and butter of lymphocytosis, once we've got reactive out the way, is CLL. Um, and with CLL, just to say, we do as little as possible for as long as possible. When I first did my training, we had keep the, the lymphocytes way down with chloramicin and probably did a whole lot of harm. Now we've had a lymphocytosis of 400. And because the patient's asymptomatic with a normal hemoglobin, neutrophils and platelets, we just leave them alone. They can even have reasonably chunky nodes. And if it doesn't bother them, the best thing is to leave them alone. Therefore, if somebody presents with, you know, over 80 or, uh, and, and they've got dementia and they've got multiple other com comorbidities, you don't really need to add another thing to their list. You just sort of keep cast an eye over their lymphocyte count every now and then. And when you see them, just think, oh, it's quite fun to get a patient on a bed and discover a few lymph nodes. I mean, so, so they're often quite fun to examine. So, um, you know, just treat that as a bit exciting that, you know, can I find a lymph node? But if you find a lymph node, don't send an urgent referral. <laughs> um, because we won't be interested for a very long time. If they're young or with a reasonable lymphocytosis, then I think it's reasonable to confirm they've got CLL just because if you're 40, you probably want to know that that's CLL and sort of keep a watching brief. But we don't want to do anything about it. You can keep them yourself. You really, really can keep them yourself for as long as possible. Um, mantle cell lymphoma can be just like CLL. There's the indolent forms that you don't have to worry about, or they can present blasty and very aggressively. And then there's hairy cell. We love hairy cells. Just a little clue to hairy cells and um, hairy cell leukemias is the, is the low monocytes. Like, you know, we don't often bother with monocytopenia. And by the way, we never worry about lymphopenia. I got to ask that question. We just, we, we ignore lymphopenia. <laughs> um, it's never, never bothered me. There's a lot of diurnal variation and it comes and goes. And outside of a context of sort of HIV immunocompromised sort of um, HIV infection. Yeah, I just haven't worried about it for 20 years. And I'm not going to start now. <laughs> um, Marginal zone lymphoma, prolymphocytic, all much more rare. But at the bottom, when, when the scientist or the hematologist comments on the lymphocytosis, they will give you advice. They will go into look, look at the cumulative lymphocyte counts. They'll go into the clinical details if you've given any. Um, and they'll look at the other counts and they'll look at the rate of progression. Uh, and they, they will, well, we try and give you advice as to what to do. And what we're saying in those comments is, please keep these patients for as long as possible. So that's the bottom line there. So if there's clinical concern, if the patient's lost weight, it's my favorite slide, you've got to enjoy that. So this is, you know, that patient you see and you think, oh, this is, this is not going well. There's a storm brewing or this patient in front of me is really, really unwell. So if they've lost weight, they've got night sweats, or um, they've got a huge spleen, um, the height of the white count doesn't matter, but if it's doubling every couple of months and you've got two or three plots, it's, it's going to matter at some point. And we always have this thing of a doubling at six months for staging of CLL. Like, has your lymphocyte count doubled in six months? If it hasn't, it's likely to be indolent. If it's doubling every six months or less, then we probably, you can put in a sort of routine referral and we'll help you deal with that. But quite honestly, you can keep them until they've got anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, 
or those constitutional symptoms or lymphadenopathy that bothers them. The treatment is quite uh, toxic. Uh, we give young people FCR treatment. And you want to play that card carefully because all, the, all these chemotherapies have downstream effects. Uh, they cause secondary myelodysplasias. You uh, develop refractory populations so that you need uh, different treatments. And then you get, you get more and more immunosuppressive treatments. CLL in itself is immunosuppressive. Uh, and remember that CLLs often will develop second malignancies. The treatment is even more immunosuppressive. So they, you know, during COVID, I actually deferred treatment of quite a few patients because I thought if I further immunosuppress you, you are going to get, um, uh, you know, I'm not doing you any favors at all. Uh, and obviously vaccination things are really important. Um, so basically the, the next test you do, once you decide that it might be clinically significant, is to do flow cytometry. So if you can do that before you send them to us, review whether you still need to, uh, then that's really helpful. And I think if they're young, your reflex for proceeding with flow cytometry is going to be a bit brisker than if somebody's in their 80s and 90s, you know, where the, the trajectory is you're going to try very, very, even extra hard not to do anything about it. So here's a little case. This is an urgent referral for lymphocytosis of 8.3. Normal for blood count symptoms not concerning and flow cytometry is confirmed B, B cell CLL. Honestly, that we don't need to see that. There's nothing concerning there and I just really want to empower everybody to look after that themselves. The other thing is giving a patient a diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia can be quite scary. Uh, and just remember that if you haven't got clonal B cells of more than five times 10 to the 9 per liter, it's not CLL. We have this little out called a monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. So it's like quite nice. It's like, you know, myelodysplasia is very different from myelodysplastic syndrome or myelodysplastic neoplasm or myeloproliferative neoplasm. So maybe you can just be a little bit less scary with your patients and just say, you know, there's this mild lymphocytosis. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit like, I suppose, um, cervical dysplasia and things as well. It's just, it just sits there. Um, and you, maybe you can downplay the significance of it rather than say, oh, you've got B-cell CLL, which sends people into a flat spin. So that's just something to think about with every patient that you see. This is a little bit more different. I mean, obviously this man had a blood count for things other than concerning features relating to lymphoproliferative disorder. His lymphocytes are a bit higher. And he's got a few abnormal lymphocytes and smear cells. But basically, this is if there's no clinical concern, you don't actually have to do anything with this <laughs> other than just monitor it. So, again, that hematologist comment at the bottom will help you decide whether it's going to be um, a CLL or something else, and we'll give you some advice. But the advice has to be taken into context of what else is going on with this person. And don't worry too much about hyperviscosity. Lymphocytes, provided they are quite small, you can get up to 400. And it's not like if you've got blast or uh, big, big cells. Hyperviscosity isn't really an issue. So you don't really need to worry. But anyway, we want you to sleep at night. So if you're not sleeping at night and you want us to address your lymphocytosis, you can. But I would say all of you will have had letters back from hematologists um, encouraging you to deal with them conservatively. And hopefully that empowers you uh, to deal with them yourself. So that's just the end of lymphocytosis. I just had two cases there because it could be a whole talk on its own, but it was just to give you hopefully a helpful guideline there.
I and like your um, definition of young, Lane. That's great. Yes, I do too. Yeah. Being <laughs> very positive. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because I've just literally had a case like this that I urgently sent off with like lymphocytes of 41. And now I'm like, oh, that's why they didn't get particularly excited. But obviously it did make me a little bit anxious. But next time I'll be yeah. much more empowered. Yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, you can't go wrong by just calling the patient back. And also that's a good way of getting to know your patients as well. And really, each time they come, they must get on the bed and you must, you know, feel for lymph nodes, feel for spleen, check their weight, ask them about night sweats. Um, they don't need CT scans is the other thing. Uh, some centers would re reflexly send them for a CT scan. They don't need a CT scan unless you are concerned. You do if you've got funny things like mantle cell lymphoma or follicular lymphoma or whatever. But the first thing you're going to do um, is a lymph node biopsy. Like if the flow isn't particularly helpful, we would still type the lymphoma with a lymph node biopsy. But you don't need to take a lymph node biopsy out in somebody with lymphocytes of 70 who's got generalized lymphadenopathy. We sometimes get that as well. And the patients had a lymph node biopsy flow cytometry and got a lymphocytosis. And then they want us to do a bone marrow as well. We hardly ever do um, bone marrows for uh, CLL anymore, unless there's an unexplained anemia and we think is it autoimmune or is it ITP or is the, is the, if the cytopenias don't match the lymphocytosis, we might do a bone marrow. That makes sense? Yeah? Yes. Any, any questions? And a lane for monitoring six monthly, would that be what you recommend? Yeah, to just look at, look at your cumulative tests to date. If, if they've doubled in three months, then you would do it in three months. If they haven't doubled in, in a year and, they, and, you, and they're well, a year is fine. Yeah. So you just tell the patient, basically, they're in the driving seat is, how are they? Um, you know, if they're well, just, just kind of leave them alone, really. Yeah. Just clarifying this there, Elaine, with... Um, confirming we're on the CLL path rather than any of those five other more scary yeah. sound differentials. So you'd first advocate maybe doing the flow cytometry, which would then give you the confirmation that CLL yeah. not yeah. any of those others. Yes, it, it, it's reasonable, but if the morphology is bound or CLL and in an older patient, okay. I think I think you know the flow cytometry services are very burdened. Uh, and I look at all the, the results of the ones from my region coming through, and I think, oh, oh what a waste of waste of resource. It's a wasted resource of the not only the money, but the time, because they all have to be looked at and interpreted by a consultant hematologist after being reported by a scientist. So basically it clogs up. Just think about the the, the work of clogging up. The system for what really matters yeah so there's enough on the hematologist comment of the blood film that there would give you a definitive diagnosis yeah. and see a yes. rather yes. than any of those other fans yes yes cool. yes right. yes again if it looks like cll and you're you are clinically concerned and the patient's got big lymph nodes or whatever then the first thing you do is is, is the flow cytometry. But if you're not clinically concerned, don't, don't bother. Yeah. Great, good clarification point. Any other questions? All good? Okay, keep going, Elaine, thank you. Right, we've got neutrophilia. No, I love neutrophilia, but it's so common, isn't it? Hey, so I've just called it bread and butter. And most of the time we see neutrophilia and we don't really worry too much about it. Occasionally, look at your neutrophilia and you'll, you'll get caviar, um, which is quite exciting. And I've got a lovely case um, to follow my little general blurb um, that just shows that sometimes it's worth going to the end of the road uh, and paying to get caviar. <laughs> um, so basically, the, thing, the critical things are how high is the white count? And when you're looking at the patient, is there a match to say this is reactive infection concerning? 
The other thing is, um, you know, when you have an infected patient, you can have a high count and it's left shifted. And we'll often report on toxic changes. And the toxic changes are brand new toxic granules, toxic baculation, uh, and doll bodies. If you get all of that with the neutrophilia, you've got infection. And even if you can't see the infection, I bet you the CRP is going to be high and you're going to treat the infection. The other little um, things to go a bit further down on your um, full blood count and look at your eosinophils and basophils. Basophils are never very high. They're either 0, 0 0.1 or at the most 0 0.2 and anything above 0 0.2 is high, which is pitiful really. So, but if you see 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0.5 consistently. And if you get two, then it's B bar, B bar, B bar, you wake up. So look at the base of the line. Uh, and it doesn't look exciting in numbers, but a little increase in your base of full. What seems a little increase in your base of full can be uh, base of can be quite exciting. Eosinophilia as well. Um, and I'm oh eosinophilia is just a nightmare as we'll come to. Uh, and then again, the the, the lab comment will say whether the morphology is normal or abnormal because um, you can have things like atypical CLL, C, CML where the morphology is dysplastic. But basically, the degree of left shift is really important. If you've got blasts, promyelocytes, and myelocytes there, that doesn't happen very often in infection. Um, one of the common things we see nowadays is uh, recovering People on chemotherapy, they get GCSF injections, and that can push their white counts up to about 60. So again, we can waste a lot of time looking at a film and worrying because there's no clinical details on the form. And if only they said on peak GCSF or on chemo, it, it could save us 10, 15 minutes of time. So, and it takes one second of your time just to put something on the form that actually helps. Tiki and Gisborne, I mean, MedLab looks after Gisborne, and we don't have any access to a portal there. Um, and so when we're reporting a Gisborne film, it's like, it's just like veterinary medicine. You know, you, <laughs> we just have no idea, no idea. And it's very unsatisfying. The other thing is, if you've got a high count in a well patient, that's a bit of an alarm bell too. And we're not talking about neutrals of six or seven, because smoking, prednisone, all those sort of things can do that. But if you've got a chunky white count of like 20 with the left shift and the patient sitting there fine, pop them on the bed and see if you can feel a spleen. That's gold, if you can feel a spleen. You often can't feel a spleen, but that doesn't mean to say you don't need to do something else. So here's another algorithm. Again, I'm not going to go through the algorithm. This is just to give you a little bit of guideline as to our thinking. Uh, and it's quite a simple one, so we won't worry about that. So this is one of my favorite cases from, from last year. Um, he works in security and for United Nations and who uh, in security, and he's done that like the last 25 years. And because he was turning 65, he came back from Nigeria, I think to log into the superannuation. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, he came back uh, and he didn't have a GP. So he went to the lab and paid for a blood test. Uh, and he had a high white count, and I saw this in the lab and couldn't contact him because his GP because he didn't have one. So I phoned him and he said, "No, well, I wouldn't. I was now going to be his GP, so I need to deal with him, which is fine." Um, and he really wasn't well, and clearly he wasn't well, with a background of for the last two years having abnormal counts. Now, when they live in these funny places, apparently the medical services and the laboratories are reasonable. So uh, he's, he's had access to blood tests. Um, but each time he's had these counts of 25 or 70, it's been thought to be malaria or some sort of infection, and he's been admitted to a flash, relatively flash hospital, got IV antibiotics, um, which has semi-settled his white count, but never much. And with this, in a very, very fit, young, fit, healthy, comorbid free man, is hemoglobin 70. And that's a bit of an alarm bell as well. Um, and he's not presenting as somebody in, with a high temperature with rigors or anything. 
um, and he's not feeling very well and he's got a bit of abdominal discomfort, which is because he's actually got a big spleen, which in Africa you wouldn't notice because lots of people have spleens in Africa because of malaria. So here's a little uh, susa of his blood counts, very anemic, thrombocytopenic, white count of 133. Remember I said, can you scroll down uh, and look at the neutrals? Now the monocytes are not a big percentage of the whole. So although this is a monocytosis, if it's less than 10%, you don't really pay much attention to that. The eosinophils are high. Normal is up to 0.4. And I was talking about the basophils. I said, you know, if you've got basophils of 0.2 or 0.3, you get excited. On this case, they're four. And we've got left shift of 38.7, which is like a quarter, uh, between a quarter and a half, a third of the total white count. So there's quite, quite a big shift there. Um, and you can see things getting a bit worse here as well, uh, all over the place, really. We, we brought them in for some blood. Just quickly while you're on that yeah. um, slide, Elaine, yeah. Just, yeah. do you want to um, remind people what left shift is? You just talked about it then, didn't oh, you? Oh, yes. So a left shift. Just to clarify that. Yes. Yeah. So a mature neutrophil has three lobes, uh, and left shift is moving towards immaturity. So if you look at the production of neutrophils, you start with blast, they then grow up to be promyelocytes, then myelocytes, then metamyelocytes, then band forms and then neutrophils, right? So a left shift with infection, you're going to get mainly bands, maybe metamyelocytes, maybe a couple of myelocytes. But if you've got a myeloproliferative disorder, you're going to get the left shift going right back to blasts. Um, and maybe not many blasts, but if you, um, if, if you look, uh, in fact, probably if I'd gone down a bit more, they probably would have specified and the number of promyelocytes and blasts. There weren't many, actually, as I recall, but there were a lot of, uh, a, quite a lot of myelocytes. So, um, the one thing about this, there were myelocytes, is eosinophils, basophils. So, as a hematologist, bingo, his story, everything fits very nicely. He's got myeloproliferative disorder. And we have common things occur commonly, and chronic myeloid leukemia is probably the most common. So we can do an urgent fish test, and basically that's about a 48-hour turnaround. Um, and we can do that on peripheral blood, which is very handy. Um, but in any event, he needs a bone marrow because the bone marrow gives us um, whether it's accelerated CML uh, and also gives us uh, cytogenetics and the bone marrow, which is thought to be important. So that's just the same. And here's his blood film. Now, when you have infection, you get toxic granulation, and toxic granulation is black. These were sort of pinky granules, which I noticed was a bit unusual. That there's a myelocyte, that there's a band. Just in case I want to make some hematologists, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, if you've got something exciting in your lab, in your a case, and you're in a hospital, go to your lab and ask them if you can see the film. They will fall over with excitement that you're interested in what they're doing. And when you form a relationship, then you think about putting clinical details on your form. Um, they will know, put a face to the name. They will phone you and they'll be interested in your patient. They'll be interested in you. Uh, and it's, it's a good relationship to develop, just as a little bit of an aside. So this is his bone marrow, which is absolutely packed. Lots coming to the party here. Essentially thinking this is CML, but it wasn't. <laughs> so we did all sorts of extra tests. And then we discussed it and decided this must be a malignancy. Because, you know, there's that thing I'm sure you remember from your student days, the leukemoid reaction, something that looks like leukemia that isn't. So we did that, and I knew it was going to be negative. This was not a man who was presenting with malignancy, but you could have had a, I don't know, kidney tumor. 
Some, some tumors do produce GCSF, which is the colony stimulating factor, granulocyte colony stimulating factor. So we've had like lung cancers where you can have massively high white counts and high eosinophil counts, and it's all related to malignancy, so that's reasonable. We then did, and this is where you, you have to pay for caviar, we did a next generation sequencing panel, and that came back negative. So he now says, well, we've got to transplant him because he's in trouble. We don't quite know what he's got, but he's in trouble, so he's got to go for transplant. Then when we were talking, it turned out that a fish test, you have to do a fish test for this PDGFRA. Now, uh, this, is, this is just caviar, right? So this is just, just to show you the end of the road that we can go to in some cases. Uh, for PDGFRA, B, FGFR1 and pcm one j 2 um, which is in our hematology book, it's a, a whole separate group of conditions. And bingo, he came back PDGFRB positive. I've never seen a case in 30 years of practice, more than 30 years, 35 years of practice, never seen a case. But I probably have seen a case, but I've probably just missed them because this is really only quite recently available. So on the one hand, you don't want to do, my point is you don't want to do markers and things on things that don't matter. But when things do matter, and there's this, you know, this very fit man needing to go for a transplant, it's worth going to the end of the road for a precise diagnosis because this like CML is actually responsible, responsive to imatinib. Now imatinib is the old leaving which now cures CML. And I wanted to just try them on imatinib. I just said, well, it looks like CML to me, right? And we just try imatinib, which you can give, it's, it's not a, it's just a free drug now. You can just, just give it to anybody. Anyway, I gave him a good dose and it worked so well, everything disappeared out of his blood. And so we had to reduce his dose and he now takes 100 milligrams three times a week and has a normal blood count. And he's going back to, to, to serve, and I think in Kazakhstan somewhere, I don't know where, I'm probably not allowed to say where he is. So you can see he's now got a completely normal blood count. I haven't updated this since last November, but you can see he was needing weekly transfusions with virtually no increment on the transfusions at all, incredibly thrombocytopenic. And here you can see his count, if you look in this mm -hmm. column here, his count went from 139 down to 9.7. Um, and all his basophils and things disappeared. And his lead shift disappeared. Yeah, and now fully normal. I've set my glands 140. His wide counts six. And his platelets are like 350. And he's very pleased with himself. And he's very pleased with me. Um, but it was like... Yeah, so that's that's the caviar case. Hello, could I yes. jump in there? Just because yeah, we've sure. had a question, and I think you just kind of implied the answer. Um, but you asked about with people on imatinib or other biological immunosuppressants, we monitor their blood counts, but what are we really looking to pick up? I guess the question is, how quickly would you expect someone's counts to drop? And how significant is significant enough to call the hematologist about a dose reduction? And can it happen? Two years well, you, you know, I don't think I don't think it's appropriate for you to monitor a matter of therapy so in the community. Say other immunosuppressants, biological immunosuppressants like infliximab was the one in, included oh, here. I've never prescribed infliximab. Um, they might be on it for other non-hematological things, Elaine. So GPs are often asked to follow up or check the full blood counts. I guess. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I wouldn't. I will, I, I don't. I wouldn't know how, how they would advise you to go suggest. But if somebody has become seriously neutropenic, and that's a neutrophil count of less than five, or at point five, neutrophil count of less than point five, that's urgent. If, you, if your platelets have been normal and they're less than 30, is that the sort of thing you're asking? Yes. Yeah. Um, if you are asked to monitor it, 
um, that's quite a responsibility. It's like with the myeloproliferative disorders, we prefer to be in control of the hydroxyurea because I know prescribing in general practice is quite, you know, somebody puts in a request for their 10 medications and it's very easy just to copy paste and print them off without. I'm not sure you've got time to check the blood count and make sure they've had a blood count before they need their script for tomorrow because they run out of pills. Um, yeah, I think it is quite tricky um, to do that. Cytopenia is always worth stopping the drug. I mean, the anti the sort of antipsychotic ones are the sort of famous ones. I don't know if I'm answering your question very well. No, I think, you are. Yeah. And then I think the other key is that the person who prescribed it as a specialist is the person we'd potentially go to versus, say, maybe a hematologist. Yes. Oh, maybe. yeah. Don't, don't, don't come to us if it's a medication. Um, but if they're sick and they're presenting to like Hara ED with neutropenia and they've been on a medication, you're going to stop that, phone us, and we will probably say give GCSF. Uh, that's granulocyte colony stimulating factor, which is an injection under the skin to boost, to drive the bone marrow to produce neutrophils. Yeah? Sounds great, Elaine. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So here's another case. Um, we've done the meat of it, so we're getting there. Um, so this is Hannah's case, is it? Um, yes, this is one, a lady that does not see her GP, but frequently comes to our ED. And often just um, severe abdominal pain and vomiting, which is normally put down to cannabis-induced emesis. Um, but she had quite interesting, um, over the years, lots of full blood counts with no sort of action. And we noted that she had an increased full blood count. And probably after one of Elaine's talks, I got a bit excited and ordered a whole lot of tests that probably didn't need to. Um, but <laughs> Elaine could show <laughs> the next slide. Um, so again, she had a elevated white cells and neutrophils were quite alarmed and had been up high the whole time. Although she had abdominal pain with each um, presentation, her CRP was relatively normal with the benign abdo exam and normal LFTs, so an abdo profile, so no other sort of cause of infection. Um, so I guess we were just, worried. Just note on that, that the degree of less shift is very minimal. Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about the... Uh, when you've got a high white count, the lips is very minimal. If you've got polycythemia vera, um, you're not going, you're tending not, you're not going to get a huge lip shift. Um, but really that that lip shift, and you've got 0.03 basophils, that's another little clue that perhaps it's not too, yeah. Um, and so when she came back in with the pneumonia, which is with the blue diamonds here, it had another big jump um, from sort of in the 20s to the to 48. So I guess um, we just wanted to show highlight um, the jump in that. Uh, at that time, she did have a pneumonia. Um, unfortunately, this lady still doesn't come back to see us in clinic. So we were kind of at a loss of whether we should be doing, trying to track her down and find, uh, do more tests or refer to him, but we talked to Elaine. And sort of, I yeah. think the most important test is at CRP. Um, and in this clinical context, your suspicion here is quite low and overall not progressive and fluctuating. So the sort of, there, there are a few little things there that like the lack of significant left shift, lack of monos, uh, lack of uh, basophils or eosinophils, um, normal platelets. It's all sort of quite reassuring, really. Did you have another slide? I can't remember. So here we are. You've got this flat, and I bet you this the neutrophils fluctuate with the CRP. Yeah, and that last CRP was in the context of quite context of quite a severe pneumonia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's it's reasonable in a young person to do the BCR able to make sure you're not dealing with CML because that is treatable. But there were no real flags there. But you know, if it's ongoing and you've got a niggle, doing doing the B BCR able on peripheral blood just puts it to bed, really. Yeah. So now eosinophilia is tricky, and I'm not going to spend much time on it. 
Um, but just to say 99% are reactive. <laughs> um, and really, the a couple of little tricks, um, stool for parasites and just empirical treatment with anti helminth fix is quite good. You know, if they've got a skin condition or lung, um, lung symptoms or um, things, then you sort of wake up a bit, depending on how high the eosinophil count is. Just remember, malignancy can cause it as well. Um, and the sort of point is towards the hematological causes, negative clinical. Um, the degree of eosinophilia, there's a thrombocytosis as well. And again, you often have abnormal morphology in your peripheral blood. Uh, the other thing is you can disappear them with steroids. <laughs> and my pragmatic method of managing them, because often bone marrows and everything don't do anything, but you can disappear them with steroids. And I've got one lady who I just keep on prednisone five milligrams and she she keeps her eosinophils at bay. And when I take her down to three milligrams, her eosinophils pop up. Um, and she doesn't have a primary hematological thing. She's just a hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Yeah. So what is a, a... Oh, here. Might be on here. Sorry, the line. Yeah. What is that? No, you've got the numbers on here. Oh, have I? I can't see them. Up the top. I was going to ask you what's a significant eosinophilia, but yeah. you've got it up here. Yeah. Yep. Um, basically, the higher it is, the more significant. I would say above four is... Is, is worth opening your eyes for. Um, under one, I don't really pay much attention to. Between one and three depends on the clinical context. And I just want to show you some eosinophils here because they're really cute. Um, compared with my other man, they have got these sort of bright orangey, pinky orange granules, which are really gorgeous. And their neutrophils have two lobes and they're really pretty, which is why I still like hematology. So monocytosis, again, it's a bit like lymphocytosis. We do as little as possible for as long as possible. Um, if they are unwell and got a raised CRP, you don't really worry. Point is towards chronic myelomonocytic leukemia is if they're more than one. And again, the degree of monocytosis, if you've got a monocytosis of 20, that's much more significant if you've got a persistent monocytosis of 1.1. And the persistence or progression as well. If you've got a monocytosis, it falls in that group of, it sort of falls between myelodysplasia and myeloproliferative. So some, some of the other counts can be high and some of the other counts could be low. So they're often anemic or mildly thrombocytopenic with a high neutrophil count, or they can have. Um, a high plagiar count, they don't often have a high hemoglobin. Um, but you're looking, you're looking for this film comment again. So that's a bit of a message that I seem to be repeating. I look at the comment. So they can swing along forever, a bit like CLL, but every now and then they can burst. And when they burst, they burst, I think in horror, we've seen that some very dramatic. CMML cases. So I think we've got one here, which is my case. Um, and I'll go through it quite quickly. Basically, she had, um, I can't see the monocytes, but they were like three or four. I can't see because you're on top of 1.4. 1.4. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Platelets 474 and dysplastic full morphology, bone marrow. That very transfusion dependent. Um, and her bone marrow, that was because she's just not making red cells. She's got red cell aplasia, which can sometimes just go with CMLL. Her other count's fine and not progressive for a couple of years. And then she just got worse and worse. She just became lost weight, got abdominal discomfort, which was shown to be due to massive splenomegaly. Um, and then she started popping a few little blasts into her peripheral blood and in her bone marrow. Uh, and her cytogenetics had evolved into poor risk. And so she's heading into trouble. And we have this drug, uh, you might have heard like, quite a few of our patients on azacitidine. 
And we're very grateful to the rural community district nurses for upskilling and being able to give the injection subcutaneously in the community, avoiding travel to mouth to mouth. They get it seven days every month. Uh, and she, she, she's done really well. So I just have jollied her along for years, but when she blew up, she really blew up. We gave splenic radiotherapy and azacitidine, and there on in, she, she's probably going to do quite badly. So you can jolly them along, um, but they do tend to blow up. And then Mark, you've got a case. This one's a bit fresh off the press. I think they're still in hospital. Um, so it was a 77 year old lady who over the course of the year initially presented with an quite an unusual septic arthritis in the spine and at that time noted to have 10 kgs of weight loss. <laughs> they hunted for a cancer on a, with a CT chest abdo pelvis which didn't see, notice anything um, and then came in with a heart attack and this whole time noted that she had high neutrophils. Interestingly the monocytes are high as well, but I think, as you said, because of the scale of it, no one really, people just look at the highest number, not necessarily the one that yeah, worries the yeah, pathologist yeah. the most. So um, we'll have a look at the graph in a second. Um, so she was in hospital with high neutrophils, sneakily high monocytes, treated with antibiotics. They were eventually stopped because it didn't make any difference and um, then came back with a pneumonia. So if we go on the next chart, so her Finally, her, at the worst, this is what her blood film looked like. Um, neutral was up to 42 and monocytes of 14, which now after your talk, I realize is very you know, significant. But, you know, an yes. hour ago, I thought is, <laughs> the neutral <laughs> films were worrying me more. <laughs> and, and enough of a left shift here. You see, like, although they're not a lot, the left shift goes all the way back to promyelocytes. Mm. which with just infection is quite unusual. So although, although these are sort of not high in number, the fact that they're there at all is also quite interesting. And notice this lymphopenia, so we're not worried about lymphopenia anymore, are we? Lymphocytes will go down in this situation quite often. And, and she's got other cytopenias as well. So she's anemic and thrombocytopenic, and she's got a very high monocyte count with the left shift. So then we sort of graphed because then she came back to us. Oh, this is the comment that's sort of very helpful. If your hematologist comments a lot of this, our ones just give you the diagnosis <laughs> down the bottom. But CMML, I think initially that didn't, you know, the difference between CMML and CMML is very significant. Yes, so it is. is we often get, yes, we, we, yes, I think uh, we often get referrals say, please see this patient with CML. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a different fish completely. Mm. It's, uh, there's only one letter in it, but it is, it's a completely different fish. And that letter is monocytic. Or yes, myelo, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia as opposed to chronic myeloid leukemia, yeah. Um, and then, yep, so this is sort of the graph where, you know, the neutrophils in blue and the uh, monocytes in green, which I think the lowest they sort of got to was sort of three. But yeah, I thought the, yeah. And now she um, is awaiting hematology input. Yeah, so I think, she probably said, uh, often these are very reactive and you just have to be a little bit patient. But when they're doing, when they're doing this, you don't know whether it's the disease exploding, but in the context of bilateral pneumonia, it's likely the pneumonia is causing the explosion, not the transformation or the acceleration of the CMML. So when you've got a, a known infection, then you, you assume it's that and wait for it to settle. And you don't really need to call the ambulance here, but she's just back to her baseline. And we're not going to do anything ever until she meets criteria for azocytidine, because there's not, not a whole heap you can do. So that was a really good case. Lovely. You see this all the time. Sometimes that explosion is the 
is the neutrophils and sometimes it's the, uh, I mean, it's the transformation and sometimes it's just reactive. But we can help you with that. So good case. So look at the whole picture. Flares with infections. Put them on the bed, feel for a spleen. I didn't, you know, I did a lot of telephone consults with that other lady I presented. And I didn't realize her abdominal discomfort was a massive spleen. And even when I put her on the bed, I actually missed the edge of the spleen. I didn't really, didn't sort of notice how big her spleen was. Because uh, sometimes tummies can be quite difficult to feel. So get used to feeling mm -hmm. for that. Um, yeah. So that's that. And then we've got through, has any questions on monocytosis? I realize I'm dabbling on quite, quite a lot, but hopefully everyone's got a bit of staying power. Just have, for another five minutes on thrombocytosis. One, one, one su super quick question there, which I actually had as well. CMML, are they immunosuppressed? Should they be on sort of Coke, Tramoxol? No, not at all. They, 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 their cells function quite well. Um, Unless they're neutropenic, we we only we only give the immunosuppressed a neutropen then neutropenia is not immunosuppression, so they don't get that. O only the um, only the immunosuppressed conditions, and even then, only the therapies, the immunosuppressive therapies like high dose steroids, glucotrimoxazole. So thrombocytosis, a couple of little tricks here. Read that comment. I'm a bit like a stuck record, aren't I? So if the count's very high, or if you if the comment says large and giant platelets, a bit like polycythemia vera, you can shortcut to do your JAK2 and send them to us. Um, but otherwise, if you've got a high platelet count, you just need to exclude the um, inflammation, infection, iron deficiency, malignancy first. And here's my little algorithm, which you can have a play with if you like. See if it works for you. And just remember, you can make your own algorithms to suit you. Um, you know, you can have magnets on your fridge, you know, <laughs> and, and have a play and have a play with your own algorithms. Yeah. Um, the things that make you wonder are things like a thrombotic history and headaches. It's amazing. I had one lady with platelets of 470. She went up to Auckland for hyperbaric therapy for her cluster headaches. Put her on hydroxyurea, and she hasn't had a headache since. So that's just a little clue there um, that the platelet count doesn't need to be super high in myeloproliferative disorders to cause headaches. Sometimes it's magically relieved by aspirin. And of course, what do we give for headaches? We give codeine and Panadol and those sort of things. Um, so an aspirin test for headaches is probably quite interesting. Don't want to be responsible for any GI bleeds. I haven't seen a GI bleed from aspirin ever. Well, not for 30 years. Um, so the things that you're looking for is the normal CRP. If it's persistent, and we're picking more and more uh, central thrombocytopenias up, up with like platelets of like between 400, 450 and 550, like for four or five years. And if we really can't think of a reason, and it's a young person doing a JAK2 is probably reasonable. So our threshold is lowered quite a bit. Uh, it does drive us a little bit round the bend, but you really have to say, you know, make sure the patient doesn't have Another reason like iron deficiency, bleeding, um, yeah, sort of asthma on prednisone, all those sort of things that can do it. This is a lovely case. He's a young, a really young man, and he came from orthopedics with a gangrenous toe, ulcerated toe, that they thought probably had osteomyelitis. Um, and they said he had Berger's disease and he must stop smoking. And so he had the most terrible, terrible toe, painful. He's a sort of a working man and he couldn't work because he couldn't put his boots on. Um, and then finally, um, he had a blood count and his platelets were high. And because his platelet morphology was abnormal, just suggested straight to a JAK2 mutation. 
um, and he was JAT2 positive. We put him on hydroxyurea with his gummy toe. His toe healed and he's here like, I think probably 12 now years down the track um, on aspirin and hydroxyurea and he's never looked back. So just remember that it's not the how high the platelets are, it's the morphology and the clinical context as well. So hopefully um, that's helpful. I think the most important thing about the highs is just to get you uh, looking at the result, giving you a little bit, a few more skills to get perspective. Um, and the, we're here to help. Clinical details are helpful. The human comments are helpful. Um, but we're happy, we're happy to help you deal, deal with your patients and help you build up your own independent hematology skills. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Elaine. Is there any questions, Hannah or Mark? There was a shake of the head. Um, actually, I think that's great. Independent hematology skills. I truly believe yeah, that after yeah. this, there will be a lot more independent hematologists, at least, you know, partial. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And um, yeah, just always happy. You can email me. I should have put my email. You can put my email at the bottom of the thing if you want. Just Elaine with a Y dot not and belt it. The, uh, what's it? Midcentral DHB dot with golf dot NZ. Um, you can you you can email me and with questions or if you've got a case for me that you just want to ask a few questions offline. Um, just go ahead. Really, just encourage you to enjoy it. Just enjoy. Thank you, Elaine. We absolutely will. So um, again, yeah, I really appreciate your time today and your time along with Mark and Hannah putting the uh, presentation together. But, uh, I am sure there will be many a person tomorrow who will look at a full blood count with a lot more interest and hopefully a lot more <laughs> confidence and significantly reduce unnecessary referrals like lymphopenias. So fabulous. Yes. <laughs> um, if everyone, I would really appreciate it. It'd be amazing if I could get uh, 38 feedback forms today. So um, if everyone, even if you don't want me to lodge the CME, if all feedback is really, really welcome and helps to uh, guide ongoing webinars for this year. So would really appreciate that. Uh, and then uh, thank you very much again for joining us this evening. You have a good night. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Mark.